All right, so good morning. We are in Titus. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Titus. Chapter 1 is where we will be. And let me open with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this day and for your love and for your word. As we get into it, Lord, guide us, direct us, open our eyes and hearts and ears that we may receive your message this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you're familiar with uh, the Genesis creation story in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth and all that it contains. And there's a line there. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now, a description for that void, formless, void, deep, darkness, would be chaos. I know, God's created it, so there should be order and establishment, and, and there is, and that's what he did. He started with, let's start with this big mess of materials, and now let's form and create and do all these things. And so he brought order out of the chaos. First he brought chaos out of nothingness, and then order out of the chaos, and, and this established pattern of creation, you know, heavens, the earth, sea, land, animals, birds, fish, people. He brought order out of the chaos. And then he created humans, put them in a garden, and things were good. Very good, even, he says. But then chaos rears its ugly head again. Sin enters the world and fractures creation. And we've been dealing with the consequences of sin ever since then. And they've just continued to grow and grow and grow and grow. And meanwhile, God has been orchestrating and working things out, the plan of salvation, calling a people to himself, line of David, his son, Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man, comes, lives perfect, sinless life, dies on the cross to again bring order out of the chaos. And from Jesus and his 12 apostles, we got the church. And the life of Paul and things spread around the world and throughout time, here we are today. But there's still chaos in the world, there's still sin in the world, there's still trouble in the world. And nowhere was that more evident than on the island of Crete in the Mediterranean, which is where Paul is writing to Titus. Paul's not there. He had been there. He left. And it says there in verse 5, chapter 1 of Titus, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Now, Crete was a hot mess of chaos and trouble and strife. And that's uh, a lot of problems there. Some problems that we still have today in churches. Some problems that uh, were specific to them. But he tells them to put in place elders, faithful church leaders. Why is faithful church leadership important? Well, because it protects the church from chaos. And chaos is what had been developing in Crete for centuries prior to the gospel. Again, the island of Crete's in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. It's got Egypt to the south, Greece and modern-day Turkey to the north, Syria and Israel to the east, and then further west, actually northwest, is Italy, which is the center of the Roman Empire, who was in power at the time. So Crete's a good location, strategic, very long history. Crete, uh, if you are not aware, was the home of the Minotaur. Do you know what a Minotaur is? Yes. A bull-headed man. There's Minotaurs all over the world, isn't there? Half man, half bull, bull head, lived in a labyrinth. That's because the palaces of the Minoan civilization were built in those kind of labyrinthine, one of those. When you put a Y in a word, it always messes me up unless it's at the end of the word, you know? I don't know why anywhere, but at the end. Anyway, so he lived in a labyrinth, and he was named for that Minoan civilization. Now they existed from like 2000 to about 1200 BC. Um, and, and the palace that was at Knossos, Knossos, the royal city, it was one of the largest and grandest buildings of its time. This was several hundred years before the Exodus. Very long history. Now they had a lot to be proud of. There was a Mount Ida in Crete, where the famous Greek legend says that Zeus was born on this mountain. And King Minos of the Minoan civilization, he was said to be a son of Zeus. And it was also, Crete was supposedly, the site of Zeus's grave. 
which doesn't make a lot of sense if you're an immortal god. Why would you need a grave? But he was born there, he was buried there, and he had offspring there. So uh, they have these myths, these legends, and that might have contributed to the same Paul quotes, all Cretans are liars. Now, they also developed an early alphabet, were well-known sailors and archers, and they show up in the Old Testament in Amos, chapter 9, verse 7, as the ancestors of the Philistines. The Philistines were a seafaring people, and they sailed over to the Promised Land and set up sort of colonies, colonies there. So Crete was repeatedly conquered by whatever power was expanding at the time because of its strategic location. And so uh, here you've got centuries of a melting pot with people and ideas and religions and mythology and all of this stuff, just again, a hot mess of chaos. And into this hot mess of chaos comes Paul and Titus and they share the gospel of Jesus to all who will listen, which includes people who had heard the gospel on the day of Pentecost early 30s, right? When people spoke in tongues, Cretans are listed there. We hear our own language. We hear you talking about God. And so they were there for a celebration in Jerusalem, and then they sailed back to Crete and started following this Messiah, Jesus. They had a large Jewish community there. And so some of them, again, began following Jesus. Now, Paul wrote this letter about 30 years later, or somewhere around 64, 65, AD. Three decades of church tradition without the full scriptures. Three decades of church description or de church uh, history and, and traditions and a lot of problems. And so it doesn't really matter specifically what the problems are, although we can tell what some of them are. The, the point is, Paul says, Titus, appoint elders, people who have, uh, know the scriptures, know the story of Jesus, know what it means to follow Jesus. <coughs> who live lives uh, that exemplify this. And if we have that solid foundation, then we can combat whatever type of heresies, whatever type of traditions, whatever thing that's going wrong there. So that's why these faithful church leaders are important to shepherd and protect the flock. Again, uh, more problems in Crete. Um, some of the other crazy beliefs, I mean, we say crazy now, but it made sense 3,000. 4,000 years ago, uh, they, Cretans emerged from the earth. They were the first Greeks, you know, Greek, they're, Greek is a bunch of islands and stuff, and like, well, we're, we're the first Greek. So they've got pride as one of their issues. Uh, the majority of the gods in the Greek mythology were born in Crete, and they were Cretans originally, humans that were elevated to deity. Now, if that sounds familiar, that's because that's what the Mormon church teaches, that God was once a man and became a deity and mankind can be elevated to deity status. So on top of that, we do have the circumcision party, Jews who said, Jesus is the Messiah, yes, and follow him, yes, but you still got to follow the law. Got to be circumcised, got to eat the right foods, got to wash the right way, got to do all these things. These are some of the problems that Paul is working to face. So when you think about this, uh, again, hot mess of chaos. Imagine walking into a theater in the middle of a disaster movie. Now, we had the best ones growing up in the 70s, the towering inferno, uh, airport earthquake. And then, uh, you know, new generations have San Andreas and some other ones. So you walk in the middle, things are burning, shaking, uh, people are screaming, you can't really tell what's going on, and then all of a sudden it flashes to one scene where there's the stable, peaceful thing, like an island of peace in a sea of chaos. And this is what Paul wants Titus to establish. These little islands of peace, of order, of faithfulness to Jesus in this chaos of mythology and false teachings. That's the need for faithful church leaders that are faithful to the scripture, that are in a right relationship with God, that can refute false teachings and put people on the right path. And so Paul says, appoint these people to lead the churches and to overcome the problems they are facing. Now just as in Paul's day, we have pride, we have mythology, we have misguided and false doctrines, we have traditions, oh my gosh, traditions in church today. You, you know, uh, as 
because I always remember this. We need to dress our best for God on Sunday mornings. I said, all right, that's in the book of Mama Said, chapter 2. Right. It, it is nice, but it's not a requirement in, anywhere in Scripture, thank goodness. But we still have some of these problems, but here's the thing. We have the whole revelation of Scripture and the Bible and, and everything from uh, how we worship to what we believe, to who we place in leadership, should be viewed through the lens of scripture. Tradition, uh, doctrine, even our attitudes should be viewed through the lens of scripture. So that's the takeaway from that first part, the need for church leaders this morning. Uh, use what we've been given in, in the Bible. Now the North American Baptist Conference, which we're a part of, our doctrinal or denominational belief statement says, we believe the Bible is God's word given by divine inspiration the record of God's revelation of himself to humanity. It is trustworthy, sufficient, without error, the supreme authority and guide for all doctrine and conduct. It is the truth by which God brings people into a saving relationship with himself and leads them to Christian maturity. So, as the uh, supreme authority and guide for all doctrine and conduct, we should use it to evaluate, evaluate everything we think, say, or do as Christians and as a church. And so what Paul wrote to Titus about faithful church leaders is included in the Bible because we have a letter to Titus, and that's a guide for us today. The need for faithful church leaders to instruct, correct, and protect the church has never changed. Threats may look different, uh, but the need is the same. So here's what Paul says these people should look like. Titus 1, verse 6, he says, If anyone is above reproach, that's the big thing, right? If they can't be uh, denigrated or slimed or otherwise uh, have any ill repute about them, they have to be above reproach. So not just do they not only do the right things, but they don't even give the impression that they would do the wrong things above reproach. The husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. So that is a great uh, list. In fact, you could hold uh, that up to a mirror and ask yourself if you are those things. Are you a faithful in your relationships? Are your children uh, not wild and crazy? And you know, they're, they're all, there's that discussion on all of these things nowadays. What does it mean to be a husband of one wife? Does that mean that you've only had one wife ever? And if she dies, you can't remarry? Uh, does that mean never divorced? Does that mean such and such? It, the main thing is it's faithful. You're, you're faithful to the one wife that you have. And uh, you can go on. I'm not going to go into too much detail. We kind of covered this uh, in Timothy last year. But um, those are things, you know, it's like, well, what does that mean specifically? And, and how do we deal with that? And, and we don't just uh, say, well, you know, but they're a really good person. It doesn't matter that he's on his fourth wife. I mean, he's really smart in business and he... He knows how to quote some scripture sometimes, so uh, I think we should put him as a leader. Probably not, right? Probably not. Was he divorced 30 years ago and he's been married for 25 years to the same wife since then and been faithful to her and the marriage is a, an example of, of Christian love? Well, I think we can overlook that divorce in the past then. <sighs> and then children. Well, how long are we responsible for our children? That's another good question. But look at those other ones, not arrogant or quick-tempered. I'm not quick-tempered, but once I get wound up, boy, not so much anymore. Sometimes, though, huh, if we're honest. Yeah, I get a nod from the balcony. Thank you, dear, for your support. Uh, not a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain. So these things, so they're supposed to be hospitable, uh, self-controlled. That's, so, you know, if you want to look at the big ones, above reproach and self-controlled. Those are huge and they're challenging. But we're looking for a person who is mature, a mature Christian, really. Uh, that could be the description of any mature Christian. It's not like these people are special and holy because of what they do. 
no one is holy because of what they do. They're only holy because of Jesus and what he did for them. But, you know, if they have this, you look at this list and you evaluate their lives, you, you can just say, well, that's, that's just a faithful believer in Jesus. They're following the scriptures. They're living for Jesus. The big difference between a faithful believer in Jesus and a, an elder or overseer is uh, be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also rebuke those who contradict it. It doesn't mean you have to know everything. I mean, I don't know if anybody knows everything, but you have to be able to go, well, let me check on that. Let, let me examine the scriptures, see what they say. So this is the qualifications or the qualities. What did I write? That's the point there. The qualities of faithful church leaders. They are above reproach, spiritually sound. They live lives that you can look at and go, that person is solid in their faith. It's someone who I would want to follow. The faithful church leaders that Titus was to appoint needed to know and live, and then they would then teach. And if you think about, you know, like I talked about discipleship, those apostles lived with Jesus. They watched him. They saw what he did. He gave them power when they needed it. He taught them. But a lot of it was just them watching and observing. And so we lead uh, mainly by example. And so here's a little story. TV repairman, uh, now this is for you kids, before there was the magic airwaves of the internet, before there was these wires that went all up and down the streets. I don't know if you guys had cable here, but we had it. I remember it was a big thing when cable was installed in our neighborhood. He dug up a little thing in the street. Actual wires went from somewhere to my TV, and we got all these 58 channels. It's amazing. We went from five to 58 channels. Now there's 5,000? I don't know. Anyway, before this, you had to have an antenna on your roof, right? And the wire went from the antenna. There was still the magic waves, but they went to the antenna and then down to the TV. So this TV repairman didn't like to think about his job when he came home. I can understand that, right? So as a result, he never bothered to install his TV antenna properly. It was on his house. He didn't fix it when an arm broke off in a windstorm. But one day, a, a new family moved in next door. And he goes, my neighbor's a TV repairman. So he goes and puts up his antenna, puts it up exactly like the TV repairman's, points it the same way, right? Faces the same direction. And then he's looking at it and he's like, this arm shouldn't be here. Breaks that arm off the antenna. Because we teach by example, whether we intend to or not. And that's the way the lives of these appointed elders, they would be subject to scrutiny and they had to be above reproach. Godly families, godly behavior. That would be the outward confirmation of this inward faithfulness to Jesus and the scriptures. They were to be an island of peace and godliness in the sea of chaos that was in Crete. Again, Crete was a society, uh, well, if you call each other liars, you probably don't trust each other, right? Mutual distrust skepticism over religious claims. It's a place that needed a solid foundation and clear direction revealed in the Word of God, which is what the elders were called to do. So, first Titus, excuse me, Titus 1, 6 through 9, 1 Timothy 3, 2 through 4. These are the two lists of the qualities of an elder. Godliness. We should look at them for us, but also for faithful church leaders. They're not things to strive for in your own power because you can't achieve them. Uh, you may be able to for a little bit, but it's in your own power and that's not what this is about. These are areas in our life that we surrender to the Holy Spirit. Lord, do your work in me, change me, conform me to the image of Jesus. And it's only because of Christ's work on the cross that we can become holy. And that only because of God in us, the Holy Spirit, we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. So, you know, God said in Zechariah, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Very good. I'll pretend one of you said that. So you knew it. You were thinking it. That's all good. Surrender to God and his work of sanctification. That's what we take away from this. We evaluate ourselves, but especially our church leaders, by these lists. 
They're always, faithful church leaders will always be needed until Christ calls us home for eternity because there's always going to be enemies of Christ wanting to lead his followers astray. And so the duties of faithful church leaders is to prevent that. And we pick it up in verse 10 now. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. I mean, think about that, right? So here they are, especially at the circumcision party. They're the ones who say you got to follow the law. Do you know the law? Do you know all the scriptures that well? Along comes someone who says they're an expert. You want to live right. You want to be saved. You want to make it to eternity. Here, teacher, we pay you to teach me and my family how to do it. And that's what they're there for. They're, they're there for the money. They're not there to help people learn about God or to teach people to be close to God. They're there for the money. So they can make up all kinds of rules, but they probably follow the, the law. But they are bad for doing that, upsetting whole families. And then Paul quotes this prophet, one of the Cretans, verse 12. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. And I'll stop there for a second. Uh, here is this Cretan poet, Epimenides, lived around 600 BC. So almost seven, well, yeah, we'll just say, 600 years after this guy wrote this, people are still quoting it. Cretans are all liars, lazy gluttons. Now, Paul's not saying that all Cretans are that way, right? Uh, he's just showing what type of people these false teachers were. They were defiled and unbelieving. And so you find some corrupt inside, hypocritical outside, and, and defiled. And then we move on uh, to 15. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Both their minds and their consciousness are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Man, Paul, oof, harsh. You write that today, you'd probably be fine for hate speech. Now, to the pure, all things are pure means that you will avoid the things that defile you uh, because inside you are pure. Um, you know, Jesus said uh, it's not what goes into you, speaking of the food loss, it's not what goes into you that defiles you because that just passes through you, right? It's what comes out because that's what's from the heart. So if you're pure in heart, the things that come out are going to be pure in heart. And you're not going to be involved in these things that would defile you, things that would uh, allow people to reproach you, things that would violate any of those list of things that uh, Paul says the teachers should be. The teachers, though, are not pure and in the external practices they preach don't make them pure. You can't make a sinner a saint just by changing his outward surroundings. It has to be an internal change. So those are the people whom the elders have to protect the church from, and that's their duty, to instruct the church in biblical doctrine, to rebuke or call out false teachers, but also to restore those who are led astray. So if this family's following a false teacher, you want to kick the false teacher out, restore the family. Also try and restore the false teacher, because that Jesus didn't just come for those of us who are good. If he did, he wouldn't have come until I was born. Just kidding. Just making sure you're still awake. The false teachers were troublemakers, and they still are today. And, you know, speaking of things, Josh was telling me about preg checking. And before they did that, right, you said there'd be cows that could get away for a few years being unproductive, possibly, never calving, just taking up your resources. And that's, these false teachers are like those cows. They use up your resources, you get little to no return on your investment, but now you know which cows are unproductive and you cull them, you hold them up to a standard, and if they don't measure up, you get rid of them. And that is what faithful church leaders do with false teachers. <coughs> Because the damage that can be done by false teachers is potentially enormous. 
not just to the church, but to the witness of Christianity. That's why it's so important to have faithful church leaders who know scripture and will use it to confront false teaching and lead the church into correct doctrine. We're supposed to oppose false teachers, re rebuke, revoke their right, right to preach or to teach or otherwise have leadership in the church. So evaluate everyone in light of scripture before allowing them to preach or teach in the church. And I have always said throughout my ministry, I don't know if I've said it too much here, but I'll say it and remember it. Uh, don't just take my word for it. Check what I say against the Bible. If it doesn't measure up, let me know. We can discuss it. And if I'm wrong, I want to know. Be also careful who you read and listen to on the radio or internet. Always have a Bible ready to check for yourself. That doesn't help if they don't preach from the Bible, of course. I once listened to a very famous and very financially successful preacher on his radio show for 20 minutes. Now, most radio shows are about 26 minutes because you got commercials at the start and end. 20 minutes of a 26 minute show and he never once quoted or referenced scripture. I don't know if he did after that because I turned it off. Like if you're not gonna teach from the Bible, you're just gonna tell stories about how great you are and tell jokes, you can go to a comedy club. Paul wrote his letter to Titus to address the need for faithful church leaders on Crete and had a bad reputation of pride and other issues like honesty. He recognized that the churches there in Crete needed organization and leadership that would lead them in sound doctrine. They needed this because there were wolves in there among the sheep trying to lead them astray. He wanted them to become uh, these islands in this sea of chaos, these islands of peace, islands of Jesus, Christian witness, and they needed instruction and protection. They needed order and peace. They needed faithful church leaders who met the qualifications that he gave there. They would carry out the duties of protecting the church from false teaching bring peace, bring stability in the midst of chaos, just like God did in the midst of chaos. Let there be light, let there be land, let there be seas that go only so far and no farther. Let there be these things, this order in the world. And that is what Paul wants to establish through faithful church leaders on the island of Crete. Now into this mess of a world, Jesus came not to punish, not to conquer, but to save humanity. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes the, war, the sins of the world away. Lived this perfect sinless life and then offered it up on the cross in our place for our sins. <clears throat> that's the message that saved Paul. That's the message that saved me. That's the message that continues to save us as preached by faithful church leaders. And it's the message that combats false teaching and brings peace to this chaos of the world. There we are again. It must be a time thing. <laughs> It's like maybe God saying, okay, time's up, you're done, wrap it up, land the plane. Faithful church leaders guide us in our witness of Jesus in a hot mess of a world. And Crete, again, was a hot mess, and so is our world today. So as Christ came to save us, he is the head of the church. He is our most faithful church leader. We should follow him and make sure that our leaders do as well. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this day and this time and your word. And indeed we thank you for the faithful church leaders we have at this church. And we pray for more, Lord. Let us all be leaders in our own circle, our own islands of peace in a world of chaos. Let us be testimonies to the greatness of Jesus Christ with our words and actions. Bless us, Lord, in this way we pray in Jesus' name, amen. It might be like the dry air.